Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman and Daniela. We explore in this presentation relational case conceptualization, ways of thinking about the key aspects needed to making a relational case conceptualization and some ideas from that that we can move forward to guide treatment. So we'll determine this why question, why a child does what they do. Why does the child express this set of symptoms now? So we examine the developmental axis, correlate relational continuity and symptom expression, examine stress and trauma and parental reactions to these symptoms. We begin with an overview of the trivium method which is a very old classical approach to doing analysis and understanding. And it begins with the inputs, gathering external knowledge, history, and observation, thinking about these, developing an understanding about what's going on internally, and then the output function the external, the wisdom, the technique. So in terms of gathering the knowledge, we have our five senses, listening, observing, tuning in to what the child's expressing, what the parents are expressing at intake. Utilizing inner knowing, intuition, gathering both direct and indirect information about the experience. So who's involved, what happened, when and where are the key questions that we focus on when gathering this information. The more internal process includes logical reasoning, thinking about cases through multiple theoretical lenses, and examining relational signposts. And that's a term that we'll introduce today shortly, which involves thinking about very specific events and episodes that occurred in the child's life. This process involves answering the why question and the narrative, the case conceptualization explains clinical information in context and guides therapy planning. Finally, the approach to technique to what to do and what not to do. What's the appropriate emotional behavioral response to the child from the parent's perspective, the therapist's perspective? What type of action or non-action should the therapist take at a given moment? What should be said and how to say it? So this is all guided by the case conceptualization, how to respond, right? Respond, do not react. So the first step is to determine the highest level of social emotional functioning that the child has achieved. When were they functioning well? What was happening? Who were they living with? What was their teacher? What was their environment like that supported this expression of health? We can utilize the transitional object 
as a developmental marker of attachment. So if the child does have this, that becomes a very significant marker that the relationship at that time was good enough and could be internalized. We seek out evidence for imaginative play as opposed to concrete operations. For example, of stacking and ordering, which is fine, but it's not moving to that next creative level of engaging the imagination. And in our minds, we're thinking about how do we illuminate the area of concern and the strengths of the child with theory and the development and implementation of a strength-based treatment plan, right? We'll be developing a plan based on what their actual capacities are after we've learned from taking a good history with the caretaker of what's the child's highest level of function. Did they succeed at kindergarten or was it a failure? Oh, third grade was the best year. You know, whatever it is, we learn when the child was doing well. And we might learn that they never really were doing well. And that's significant as well. Identifying so psychosocial resources present in the child's world. Engage parents and other significant adults as change agents by building and repairing relationships, communicating and setting limits, establishing boundaries. So at first we're looking at the highest level of functioning over the life. Now we're identifying significant caretakers, change agents. It might be a nanny, it might be an au pair, it might be a stepmother. But who are these important people in the child's life? And what are ways that we can engage these parents in building relationships and repairing relationships? So the highest level of functioning will wonder, has a plateau of healthy functioning been noted in the child's history? This is usually apparent in the child's behavior and interpersonal relationships. When, for example, was the child happy and content and cooperative at home and energized and focused at school? Where did this occur? Who were the significant adults involved in the child's life at that time? Another relational signpost, the symbol of attachment, the blankie teddy bear. The presence of a transitional object in a child's developmental profile denotes the presence of good enough early child care. It is important to underscore the point that no conclusions about the child's emotional well being can be drawn from the absence of a transitional object in the child's developmental history. However, we can glean from the presence of a transitional object that the child has entered into a phase of development that can be thought of as the beginnings of the capacity to play and to make use of symbols in the service of emotional regulation. If you want more information on this particular topic, we have other presentations focused on the transitional object. And it would be great if you wanna learn more deeply about how to use transitional object in case conceptualization to learn about those other presentations as well. So the working hypothesis, the child does have a transitional object, then we can use the therapeutic relationship to support healing and development. The child has the template for a relationship and we can build a relationship with them knowing that. 
So we encourage the child to engage in relational repair work. We move into it, helping them understand their own relational reality, examine significant disappointments and disruptions that have occurred with significant others, repair and resolve what can be resolved through formal and informal approaches. The aim is relational repair and forgiveness and acceptance. So the child has a transitional object. They had a good connection. Maybe father went away. Maybe he was deployed in a military. Something happened that created an experience of disruption, of deprivation for the child. And by putting words on it and helping the child understand what they're going through, they can move into this place of repair and acceptance. Going from the two-person relationship, we move into the three-person relationship, the family triangle. And wonder about the child's experience in the family triangle. Enmeshed with one parent, rejected by a parent, accepted by both. Was there sufficient opportunity to play one parent off the other. This opportunity to discover the limits to their omnipotence. Has the child accepted and identified with the same parent, same sex parent? Is there identification with the opposite sex gender parent? And what are the opportunities that are coming through this identification or perhaps the limitations that are coming from that identification. So the relational signpost is, what is the nature of this three-person triangle? Who's on the outside? Who's the third? Is the parental bond strong enough to handle the child's efforts to break it up with their omnipotence and their wish to have one parent all to themselves. So we're talking about working through the disappointment. What can be thought of as the first disappointment where the child really wants something, wants to have control over something and they're, they're not able to have access to that in the way that they want. The child was reported to have had a reasonably secure attachment, but currently is symptomatic with anxiety and restlessness, a demanding self-focused approach to living. Often you'll see discrete or more generalized phobias with the caretakers accommodating accepting and more passive relationship style where they're more likely to give in to the child's tantrums then ask the child to make the corrective and get with the program of the family so if the parents are overly accommodating and adapting to the child at this stage they're going to reinforce the omnipotence and reinforce the symptoms of anxiety and restlessness and this more demanding, tantruming approach. So we examine the child moving into the play stage of health and identify that play does belong to health and leads to group relationships. Playing is a form of communication and psychotherapy. Playing has to be spontaneous and is by definition not compliant. The playing child inhabits a space that cannot easily be left nor easily admit intrusions. You know, we think of the playing child after school before dinner and you call them to dinner and they get all frustrated because they're playing and it's dinner time, I'm playing. And often just a little bit of over preparation 
you know, dinner time in 10 minutes, five more minutes, the child has an opportunity to kind of wind up the play and bring it to the climax they want before before they're pulled away from their play experience. And it's one way parents and other adults can show respect for the child's play. Playing implies trust and occurs within the intermediate space between the subjective and the objective. Like we talked in the transitional object piece, the objective is just a piece of textile and the subjective is my blankie, right? And the play occurs in, in that space between those two things. And of course, playing itself is very satisfying. So we move now to looking at continuity of lived experience over time. And this is just a very simplistic way of dividing the life into three parts. Okay, early history, the past two years, and at the time of the interview, right? What brought them in? And we can see here that there's one group that had, you know, the same mother and father continuously in early history. There were no changes in the past two years. And at the time of the interview, everything has been continuous without changes. We have another family, right, who had continuous early history and in the past two years, but just in the past three to four months. The parents have gone through divorce or dad was relocated to another city and the whole family moved to a new town. And um, dad's been traveling extensively. and The child hasn't seen father for, for many months. Um, we would have this experience of discontinuity at the time of the interview. Perhaps there was an experience of healthy early history and some kind of parental health situation set in and the child had to be raised by another set of adults, grandparents. And the child moved in with the grandparents and then at the time of the interview, the grandparent had passed. Okay. And here we have discontinuity of a different type. In the fourth category, there's discontinuity followed by a very good recovery and then the loss of that attachment caretaker. The final category, there's discontinuity followed by discontinuity this is the child who's bounced from foster home to foster home. Maybe they work with the youth authority. They just have been kind of bouncing around from place to place, and there is no continuity of experience for them. So we'll take a look at this idea of continuity of lived experience and, and look at it compared to symptom expression. So here again, we have the early history, the past two years, and at the time of interview. And now we're thinking about the symptom expression. So we have the child with the secure attachment, and there was no unusual symptom expression. They were on developmental track. And then something happened recently that's brought on this symptom expression whatever it might be, stealing, an angry mood, irritability, difficulty sleeping, refusal to eat, something, some very significant symptom has emerged. But before then, there's nothing notable. Another case, we have a secure attachment, um, no symptoms in the infant years, and then the symptom shows up, let's say, during the kindergarten transition and has persisted through third grade.
Now we have the early history where there was symptoms, the symptoms of an insecure attachment in the early years of life, followed by a notable recovery and a secure attachment with a secondary figure. And then we have symptoms showing up at the time of the interview. We have the other most difficult type of case, right, that had a difficult, insecure attachment and has basically been expressing symptoms for an extended period of time of either behavior, regressed behavior, um, eating issues, soiling issues. But these have been notable from the get-go with, with no noticeable plateau where the symptoms abated for any significant period of time. So we're thinking about continuity of the relationship caretaker and symptom expression and seeing if there's connections that we can see that, oh, this symptom appeared after father went on military deployment. Where this symptom appeared after you moved from that town to this town. Or when your mother went into hospice care and you had to go and take care of her and see her, this is when your daughter's symptom appeared. So we're starting to look at kind of relational caretaking and symptom expression. So if the child has had a period of functioning well that is followed by a period of functioning poorly, look for changes in the child's social environment. Has the child experienced loss? Are regressive symptoms present? Has the child been disappointed in some significant way by significant adult? One parent is perceived to treat the other children in a home better than the other ones, and there's this perceived deprivation. When we're doing our work, we're trying to link the behavior of the child's experience of deprivation. So they feel like they're owed something, right? The child knows what it's like to have something happen pretty good, and then that's removed from them. And it's like, well, wait a minute, what, a, what about me? Somebody's forgetting about me. And they can put that accent on the outside environment. And it's a, something that we can really help a child who's in the experience of this loss and they want to be understood. They feel like somebody's forgetting about them. In closing of part one, of our video on relational case conceptualization, we look at symptom as a communication. The child's withdrawn, angry, irritable, greedy, demanding, unaware. Right? What's being communicated underneath? The diagnostician must consider how the particular symptom or symptom cluster represents behavioral communications from the child regarding a significant adult in their lives. So a child from a divorced family or separated family, a newly reconstituted family is going to have feelings, strong feelings about this. And how are these feelings being expressed? through symptoms, symptoms of being difficult to be with, being anxious, depressed, destructive, perhaps it's stealing behavior, right? All related to the feeling of deprivation. So what is the communication related to an aspect of the lived experience of the child, right? Not having their two parents living together anymore. So what are we meant to understand by that? 
This concludes part one of our discussion where we examined the child who began life with a good enough attachment, one who, let's say, had a transitional object, and things were secure, and then things went poorly. In part two, we're going to look at those cases that come to us where the attachment was compromised and not good enough. Please come back and join us. Psychological Explorations for part two, when we present more material on relational case conceptualization with attachmently a compromised youth. Thank you for joining us for part one of our presentation on racial, relational case conceptualization.